So next up is Emily Oakley, and uh, I, I have said that if it weren't for Emily, Emily serves on the National Organic Standards Board, and she is on the uh, executive board of the Real Organic Project, which means she has spent mostly one hour a week in a meeting all, all year, and she already spends so many hours in these other things. Um, and, and it really was a call with Emily where she said to me, and I've quoted it, but I'm going to quote it again, and we were trying to decide if we were going to be a Vermont organization or a national. And she said, Dave, Vermont can do it without Oklahoma, but Oklahoma can't do it without Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then she said, but we have real organic farmers here too, and we need your help. So we need to do it together. So Emily. Look at what they gave me, a microphone. Um, okay, so first of all, thanks to everyone for staying this whole time, because it's a long time. And I wanted to just ask, how many people in the room are farmers? Would you raise your hand? Yay! Okay, if you're not farming now, how many people in the room want to farm at some point in the future? Awesome. So that's like practically everyone. Um, so... How many are gardeners? Okay, there we go. Yeah, that, then that's definitely everyone. That's, def that's everyone. We're covered. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you guys about is a little bit more of in the weeds, kind of the practice, the nuts and bolts of some of the stuff that we do on our farm. But it is all related. And you'll get to see yet another CAFO photo in this presentation because um, we just can't escape those. So um, this title is like working toward low input. Um, and that's really a goal. It's a super hard one to achieve, but that's kind of the process. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit of what we've tried to do on our farm. And yeah, okay. So my farm is in Oklahoma. Uh, we own 20 acres and we till about two and a half and we have about an acre and a half and kind of cover crop rotation. The balance is in wildlife habitat, which our neighbor constantly asks if he would if we would like him to come over and help us mow that back down again, because it was so much nicer before we moved there. Um, what can I say? Um, I'm like, you live in the country, but hey. So we're a two-person operation, although that's not totally true anymore, because we had a child, and she both diminishes our labor. <laughs> but we also have a friend who comes and helps us on our Thursday and Friday harvest days, which is a huge gift. It's our full-time job. We do not have any off-farm income. And uh, I think that's an important piece of you know, our stories and what we're trying to achieve. Oops, sorry, if I move this thing away from my mouth, you can't hear it. Um, we sell at a farmer's market and a CSA. And although we could grow year round where we are, we choose to take a break. And we say that it's for our soil and for our souls. It's kind of that regenerative time for ourselves. And uh, we keep kind of getting smaller and smaller in terms of the number of weeks that we market and the amount of land that we market, which is sort of why our goal is to stay as small as possible while still making a decent living and minimize external inputs as much as possible. And we're starting our 16th season. So these are just some of our fields. There's nothing exciting <laughs> about what we do on our farm for all of you vegetable growers out there. It's basically what everybody does. We've done blueberries. They're so hard in Oklahoma. They are now in another field. <laughs> They're in the ground again. Um, but yeah, this is just you know kind of what we do. We learned from the next speaker who's going to be coming up how to do it. There's no way we would be here if it weren't for our internship. Um, just a little bit more of what we do. We started out on three acres of leased land in the city area of Tulsa and bought our own farm after three years. And we've grown cover crops from the beginning of our farm, but um, we're in an area where we don't have a lot of compost. And uh, it makes fertility issues a real question. And we, um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but we're also vegetarian, so we think about you know, where our inputs are coming from. 
And we live in a part of the country that is getting inundated right now with CAFOs, chicken CAFOs. These are new. We have always had chicken CAFOs because that industry really did start in my part of the country, Northwest Arkansas um, in particular. But those were like, you know, two, four houses, 30,000 birds in a house. Doesn't that just sound so tame? Now we have like six, 12 houses in a facility or more and 50,000 birds in a house. Um, so while all this other fun NOSB and ROP stuff was going on, we got inundated with another 200 houses within about a 20 mile region. So these houses are actually like a couple miles from my farm. So that makes it a little bit of a different story because it's, it's affecting me personally. And I, I won't go into all of that now, but it definitely makes us think about our fertility in another way, maybe that we hadn't fully thought about it before. So we always wanted to minimize inputs. We have always minimized, you know, trying not to side dress, trying not to do foliar feeding. It's hard to do at the beginning, but over time it's, it's a lot more possible. Uh, because chicken manure, when we first moved to our farm like 13 seasons ago, um, is so readily available, and it was, it was from those little baby houses that it didn't feel quite so crazy. And we, were, we had six pounds of nitrogen to the acre uh, when we bought our farm. We, I always thought those really were glacial deposits, Francis, but whatever, they definitely didn't make it to Oklahoma. Um, we have really old weathered soils that come from limestone and a church substrate, so there's not a lot of natural fertility. It was a grazed out horse and cow pasture that we converted to our fields. So we use chicken manure, um, and we used it for our first two years on both of our fields, and then subsequent to that, we tried to alternate so that there would be a field that didn't get it every year, but it felt like this sort of like dirty secret. I mean, it wasn't a secret because we weren't hiding it from anyone, but it felt like something that we, we knew in our hearts was not in keeping with our, our thinking, but we didn't feel like we had an alternative. So we're growing cover crops this whole time. Um, and we're, we're trying to decide, do we feel like we're comfortable? Are we at that threshold where we can say, we don't need manure anymore? Um, and so four years ago, we stopped applying manure. Since that time, we have tried different amendments like lime. Um, we've done that twice. We applied feather meal, but hey, that's also coming from these CAFO operations. Um, we've done some micronutrients and trace minerals. And this year we bought um, soybean pellets. I don't quite know how that's gonna pan out, but there's like still this part of our thinking that I totally have to admit that's sort of like, well, we don't have a nitrogen source. You know, our cover crop's gonna be enough. And what's unfortunate is that there's not a lot of research out there about how to grow your fertility completely on your own and not bring it into the farm? And if, is that a sustainable system? And can you get enough nutrients from a cover crop? I mean, we've had a cover crop of peas that you know, before the cover crop, the soil test had like 30 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. And after the cover crop, it had 150 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. I'm not a soil scientist and you know, when it's all bioavailable and all of that is a whole other discussion. But it's still very hard to find literature for growing vegetables exclusively on cover crops. So that's our goal. <laughs> We're definitely not there yet, um, but that's kind of where, where we wanna go. So hopefully this isn't too much detail for you, but uh, we do two main cover crops and we have two main fields and we rotate a summer and a spring field. And the spring field, um, will have come out, well, they will all have come out of this winter cover crop um, of oats, peach, peas, veg, daikon, and we added barley this year because as everyone knows, the more cover crops you're getting, the better activity you're getting in the soil. Um, it's sown in September. It typically winter kills in January, and it, it grows really quickly for us in the fall, but it's also easy to incorporate in the spring when we're trying to plant. In the summer, we do the sorghum Sudan grass, sun hemp, sunflower, soybean mix. And uh, it's amazing how quickly that stuff grows. We've tried um, like a number of other cover crops like cow peas, foxtail millet um, in mixes. Those are super drought tolerant, super quick crops, but they don't give you the same biomass that this mix does. Um, but we can, yeah, so at, like at the beginning of July and we're mowing it down kind of by the end of August. So this is the one time that our farm <laughs> looks like this. 
and it's at sort of that beginning of September time when we're tilling in our summer cover crop and we're tilling in our summer crops and we're getting ready to plant our fall winter cover crop. You can kind of see, you know, all the sort of vegetative matter that's still in the ground. We try to reduce the tillage, of course, as much as we can. Um, in an ideal world, we might be able to flail mow it, disc it, and then go straight into the grain drill and not use the rototiller until it's time to make a bed come spring or summer. Um, it's, you know, that whole question of tillage is a really difficult one because when you're relying on cover crops, to some extent, until we perfect this cover crop crimping and the technology that'll go around with it, you need to incorporate that cover crop and to be able to grow a crop the next year. Um, so this is that cover crop that's planted in the fall, just a couple of weeks after it's germinated. And then this is that same cover crop, which is the oats, peas, vetch, daikon mix, about a month and a half after growing. And this was a day when we were trying to fly a kite. And it turns out that your cover crop field is like the best place to try not to get your kite caught. <laughs> and then that's that same cover crop um, about two months later. So this is sort of like the end of November. And you know, if we get a frost, it's going to kind of go back. But by the time we get a real freeze in December, we really do have a really good amount of vegetative matter. Oops, moving that away from my mouth. So this is that same cover crop um, over here, like in February when we're planting. Um, we're planting fava beans in the middle of February, but this February, it's so wet, we're not doing that. So in an ideal world, we would come in, do one tillage pass with the rototiller, make a bed. You can see all the organic matter that's still there, the vegetative matter that's there, um, and then plant right into that. But what's awesome about the vetch is that if you don't get too much growth on the oats in the fall and the vetch is able to grow, that starts coming back um, like the end of February, beginning of March. So this is, the, this is like the end of May and it's had time to come back and we are in Oklahoma, so I know it's totally different climate up here. Um, but what you can kind of see is that we're like mowing it down and then we're making a bed and we're planting into that. So we're trying to keep it covered as much as possible. We can get like 10 inches of rain in a day really easily. And that's really fun. So if you don't have your soil covered in Oklahoma, you are going to have erosion. So the only reason I put this slide in is um, this is our hot, super dry Oklahoma summer. You might think our soils look really bad, but that's their, you know, their sort of limestone substrate. But up here you can see, I don't know if you can tell that there's some dried vetch. So this is actually, like crazily enough, this is like August. And that vetch that we mowed down at the end of May has been this cover and a weed inhibitor over the whole course of the summer. And as we've needed fields for summer crops, we just till it in, make a bed, and the, what remains is forming this, you know, this nice cover for us. So we do do some spring planted cover crops occasionally. Um, our goal since we took out our blueberries and peaches, um, those were some failures in Oklahoma, was to get more land in sort of that fallow period rotation. So in an ideal world, we have basically half of our farm in cover crop for nine months out of the year because it's going from the winter fall cover crop you know, into a spring crop and then into the summer cover crop. So it's sort of that lay system that Elliot talks about in a much more uh, abbreviated version and without the livestock. Um, but I think the, you know, the goal for us is to see, can this, can this be achievable? Like, can we move away from any animal supplements? So, you know, the reason that I wanted to show you that picture of the CAFOs is that that is affecting my neighborhood. That is affecting me. That is affecting my water. A spring that was built at the end of the Cherokee Trail of Tears, has an old spring house on it, um, went dry this year. And we didn't have that bad of a drought. We had a slightly dry summer, but we'd had way drier summers in 2000 and 2012. Other people around my area were also saying that their springs and their wells were going dry. Can you get people to acknowledge that these huge wells that they're drilling for these chicken houses is a correlated cause? No. And I mean, we can't make that, we can't make that conclusion, but it doesn't take 
a rocket scientist to form the connection and to at least call into question that. So it made it even more urgent for us to try to move away from feather meal, to try to move away from any source of these CAFO manures. And it's really hard to do. I have no judgment for anyone using manure sources. It's, it's a really difficult thing. It's, you know, it's kind of something that's hard to, it's hard to grow organically without it. But it is sort of the underbelly in many respects of some of the things that we do. And what the NOSB has taught me is that these products and these materials that we use, they have a story. And sometimes it's not a story that we want to know. But I do think that there is, there is movement, there is possibility towards moving away from this. This is our summer cover crop about two weeks before we're going to till it in. This is it when we're about to till it in. This is when we're tilling it in. And it's, you know, it's eight feet tall. It's well over my head. It's a huge amount of biomass. This is like going through the cover crop, trying to mow it down. Um, and, you know, I think the thing is, what's hopeful about organic farming is this notion of continuous improvement that Lindley is always trying to talk about. It's this notion that each season we get to try again and we get to think about our systems in a way that maybe we can think how might we try to do this a little bit differently, maybe a little bit better. Um, so hopefully um, in the future, <laughs> we will be able to come back to you and tell you that we've found a way to really get to growing our own fertility. Um, but it is, definitely, it is definitely the goal. It's sort of the holy grail. We'll see if we get there. Um, and I also just want to say thank you to my partner for being back at home building the deer fence while I'm here <laughs> talking to you guys. Um, so thank you guys.